as I went into Macedonia, so that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to endless genealogies and questions, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, Timothy. You do that, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4. That's how Paul opens the letter. And then midway through the letter, he says, I hope to come to you soon, but if I delay, I've written this so that you might know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Paul was hoping to make it to Ephesus soon. But in his delay, or maybe even in his absence, so long as Timothy had the six chapters that you and I know as the book of 1 Timothy, he would be well equipped to accomplish what God would have him to. He would be well on his way to making sure that the church at Ephesus was all that they could and should be. And so Paul says, Timothy, I'm sending you to Ephesus on a special assignment. Do the work that I've assigned you to do. Make sure that no one teaches anything false. And make sure that the church operates in the way that it should to the glory of God. We've been preaching through a series of lessons on 1 Timothy on Sunday nights, and you remember where we started in chapter 1, where Paul says, Timothy, focus on the doctrine. Make sure that people get the doctrine right. In chapter 2, he talks about worship, and I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, and we talked about our worship and the need to get those things right and even slow down on occasion and make sure that the right individuals are leading. In chapter 3, he talks about elders and deacons, their qualifications, as well as the type of work that they should do. And then in chapter 4, Every one of us is to use our gifts to the glory of God. The last lesson we looked at was from 1 Timothy chapter 5, where Paul says, you're a family. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, you treat the older men like fathers, younger men as brothers. You treat the older women as mothers, the younger women as sisters with all purity. And then he got into that detailed discussion about what we're to do for widows and those that are in need. And now we come to the last chapter of the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and our last sermon in these series of lessons. If Timothy were to heed the words that Paul gave in 1 Timothy, the church at Ephesus would continue to be spiritually successful. And if we heed those words, we will be a church pleasing to God. Turn your Bible to 1 Timothy 6 tonight. It's fitting that the book ends with the 21 verses that it does, because in these verses, Paul is driving home his point to Timothy about making sure that Timothy keeps his eye on the ball, that the church is not sidelined or sidetracked by other issues, and he reiterates some of the things that he said before about doctrine, but more than that, he'll talk about their relationship to finances, their relationship to one another, their relationship to the doctrine, but most of all, Timothy's relationship to God. And so tonight, as we conclude these, this series of lessons on a church pleasing to God, what I want us to look at is what Paul says in general about snares to avoid that would ultimately corrupt our souls. Carl Barth was right when he said, it's not just about getting the doctrine right, it's about getting the doctrine lived. And that's what Paul drives at in 1 Timothy 6. It's not just what we know, but it's what is that going to do to our lives. And that's how Paul concludes. The first thing Paul says is this, number one, be careful about your behavior before the outsiders. Notice 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2. He says, let as many as are servants under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, <clears throat> that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And those that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but instead do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things you teach and exhort. Now, appreciate that slavery was just common in the first century world, in the ancient world. People would find themselves as slaves for many different reasons. Sometimes an individual might sell him or herself into slavery, or they might have been captives in a battle of some sort, or maybe they were born into a family of slaves. And Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 7, 21, if you can obtain freedom, you should do that. And then in the book of Philemon, he has a discussion about a Christian master and a Christian slave and how they should inter interact. But in 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2, that's not Paul's discussion. Paul is talking to slaves, and he says, now this is how I want you to behave. Those that are under the yoke of their masters, I want you to give them honor so that the word of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You might draw a connection between 1 Timothy 6, 1, and then 1 Timothy 5, 17. You remember Paul told the church at Ephesus, make sure that those that rule well, the elders, be counted of double honor, 1 Timothy 5, 17. And now he says to these servants, these slaves, you make sure that you give your masters the honor that they're due. Romans 13, 7, we give fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. And these slave masters were worthy of honor, and that's what the slaves should give them. In verse 2, he goes on to say, and if your master happens to be a Christian, 
That doesn't mean you can slack up because you're a brethren. He says, instead, you should do them service because they're beloved. They're partakers of the benefit. Love the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2, 17. The people that would benefit from your faithful service are Christians, and you should all the more serve faithfully because that is the case. Now, we don't have a direct parallel to the slave master system of the first century, but the point still stands. If we would avoid snares to the soul, it's to the degree that we would watch careless behavior before outsiders. Paul's saying to the slaves, listen, you're Christians, and that should make a difference in how you're governed. Don't be like the other slaves that worship pagan deities. You might write down Ezekiel 36, verse 20, and Ezekiel 36 and verse 23. In both of those passages, as God is rebuking the people of Israel, he says to them, my name is despised among the heathens because of how you Israelites have behaved. My name's not honored. I don't get the respect that I'm due. And it's because you guys are not living like you should before the outsiders. We should be aware of being stumbling blocks to those that we should be leading along the way. And so we don't have the slave master set up, but we've got similar circumstances, at least ways that this text could be applied. And that is to say we should do our best on our jobs, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, those that we interact with, to be above reproach and be the people that God would have us to be. Paul wrote to the same Christians in Ephesus, not in 1 Timothy, but in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, 5 through 8, and he said, Now you servants, obey your masters, and you make sure that you do it, not with eye service as men pleasers, but obey from the heart as if you were obeying the Lord himself. You serve Christ. Colossians 3, 23, Paul says, Whatever you do, you do it heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men. You will receive your reward from the Lord. Make sure that when people that are outside see you as a Christian, you live the right way. I looked up an article this week on how to get fired from a job. Not that I want to, but I was just wondering what they say. They listed a few ways that you might get fired. If you lie on your resume, they say you're tanked. You probably get fired if you lie on your resume. If you do a lot of gossiping on the job, you're probably going to be noted as a problematic employee, and that could mean you get the pink slip. Maybe they, if you just continue to have bad relationships with people on the job, or if you always blame other people, it's always them and never you, that might, that might eventually get you fired. You're always late. If you try to look for another job, but you don't do it discreetly, and they find you looking for another job on the job, they'll just help you out the door. You'll be done. There were other ways that you could lose your job. You might get fired if, for some reason, on the job, you spending too much time on the phone. You take too many personal calls. All of these things. Sometimes when you're interviewed, the people that are interviewing you say, now, look, this is how you get this job. This is what we want. You can keep this job if you behave this way. But if you don't do so, if you do these behaviors, this will get you fired. Paul's point is this, more than being concerned with being let go by an earthly ruler, remember that God's watching. Would you look at the text with me again? I'm in verse 1. Underline this last part. Slaves are to do this, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, here's the question for you and me. Do people on our jobs, in our schools that interact with us, find Christianity to be more attractive, or are they repelled by it because of the way that we behave? Can you imagine a slave in the first century hearing these words and disregarding what Paul said? He's lazy, uncooperative, always complaining on the job. And every Saturday at quitting time, he got together with the other slaves and maybe even his master and said, look, tomorrow we're going to meet down at the rented hall, the school of Tyrannus. There's going to be preaching there. Our preacher's name is Timothy. If you come, it'll change your life. We'd love to have you come and visit. You know what they might say? It hadn't changed your life. Why should we care? You haven't done anything different. 1 Peter 2, Peter says in verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beg you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust that wars against the soul. Have your conduct honest among the unbelievers, the Gentiles, so that when they see your good works, they may glorify God in the day of visitation. Live the right way before outsiders because they're watching. Sometimes a person says, only God can judge me. That's false. But not only is it false, people may make the wrong judgments about God and about the church based on the way that we behave. If we're going to be a church that pleases God, we've got to make sure that our behavior before the outsiders is the way it ought to be. Paul says, now slaves, make sure that if you're under the yoke, give your masters the honor they're due. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, sometimes when I'm coming to worship on Sunday, I get behind one of these, we'll just call them Floridian non-drivers. That's what we'll go with. And they're driving slow, or they don't use a blinker or something like that, and I, I may get enraged. You wouldn't believe that, but I'm a human being. I get frustrated, and I'm often thinking in that moment, what if this person follows me to the building? What if I do something stupid? 
and they're, they're a visitor. One of the church members has invited this person, and I've honked them off the road or something, and they pull right into 1807, and we try to talk to them about the gospel. Well, I've been successful up to this point, but keep me in your prayers. <laughs> Paul says, you make sure people are watching. Isaiah 49, 6, Israel, you're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They drop the ball. Jesus says, now, Christians, you get a fresh start. If our behavior is right before outsiders, we've got to get the doctrine lived. We'll be pleasing to God. On our jobs, we should be standout employees. We might not be the smartest. We may not be the highest paid, but nobody's going to outwork us. Nobody's going to be more honest and somebody that's trustworthy. Timothy, remember to tell the servants to obey their masters. Here's number two. Paul says, beware of a casual view of Scripture. In verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is in accord with godliness. And so if these false teachers came in and they didn't consent to these words, and this word consent is a word that means literally to come to. So if they didn't make the mental journey to the truth, if they don't consent to sound words and they don't go along with the teaching that's true, Paul's going to say later on, I want you to avoid these folks. Nothing will hurt a congregation more in the efforts to be pleasing to God than a casual view of Scripture. You remember at the beginning of this epistle, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. False doctrine was trying to creep into the church at Ephesus. And so Paul says, be equipped, know what you believe, know why you believe it, because a careless view of Scripture will ruin your influence. It'll ruin the church. Hold firm to the sound teaching that you've heard. Look at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. 2 Timothy is similar to 1, but Paul seems to be more urgent in this letter as this is his last letter to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 1, 13, he says, Timothy, you hold fast to the form or the pattern of sound words, which you've heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hold firm to the teaching. Don't have a casual view of Scripture. Make sure that Scripture is upheld high. One of the snares to the soul, souls of members of the church is to start to view Scripture as less than it is, is not to see it as lofty as God has given it to us as it's inspired by God. A church that's pleasing to God will have the right view of Scripture, which says, preach the word. We won't muzzle the messengers. These things teach and exhort with all authority. Let no man despise you, Titus 2 and verse 15. We're going to teach the truth. We're going to hold firm to the truth. We're going to preach the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. We're going to say what we mean, but we don't have to say it mean. We'll get the truth out, and so people will know about it. And then look at verse 3 again in 1 Timothy 6. At the end of verse 3, he says, which is in accord with godliness. That is, our Bible classes, our sermons, even your personal devotions and mine have to be going somewhere. If we won't have a casual view of Scripture, it's to the degree that when we open up this book to read it, we get it right, and then we get it lived. It leads to godliness, transformation. Romans 12 and verse 2, be not conformed, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we come into contact with the Bible and it comes into contact with our hearts, we leave as changed people. Otherwise, we don't consent to the wholesome words. We don't come to the truth, as Paul says, and we don't have the right view of the sound doctrine that Paul is pleading for. He says, don't let this happen, Timothy. Make sure that they hold to the truth. Make sure that they hold fast and firm to the doctrine. We're a long way from reading newspapers. Who, even, who reads a newspaper any, anymore? Paper newspaper. Most people don't. We've got some. Charles Paulins. Congratulations. But the way newspapers are set up is strategic. It's by design, isn't it? The front page is the exciting news. That's the stuff that comes first. After that, they give you maybe the national news, the world news, the local news, and then it's business, sports, entertainment, and then the classifieds. It's set up strategic on purpose. When we come to the Bible, it's not set up that way. You might read a newspaper, and as you're going through, you start to think, the closer I get to the back, the, the further I'm getting away from the serious stuff, the stuff that really matters. When we read the Bible, all of it matters. Paul talks about the wholesome or the healthy words. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day, Psalm 119, 97. Stay away from the false teachers, Paul is saying to Timothy, because they don't take the Bible serious or seriously. Now, tonight I'm preaching to people on a Sunday night who love the Word of God who love the Bible, who wouldn't let false doctrine be taught to them or ingested or believe it. But we need to make sure that we don't have a casual view of Scripture. We need to examine our hearts and be sure that the words are really penetrating, that we really are doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. Daniel Nahus, in his book on the New Testament, he says, we have a generation 
full of Bible quoters and not Bible readers. And what he means is this, that many people know parts and pieces and verses and bumper sticker quotes about the Bible, but few people are really interested in delving into its pages and seeing all that's there, reading the Bible for its richness and for its wholeness. And so Paul tells Timothy, make sure that you hold Scripture up high. Scripture is heavy. Don't take it lightly. These are my family members, Jesus says, those that hear the word of God and keep it. But the false teachers weren't interested in that. They were interested in their own agenda. Paul says they do not give consent to the wholesome words or the doctrine. They've got their own agenda. There's only one gospel. And Paul taught the same thing in every church. And a high view of Scripture always leads to a high view of the God who gave it. A low view of Scripture, a low view of the Bible. Well, that's just your interpretation. I know that's what the Bible says, but maybe there's more to it that God hasn't told us. Often leads to a lower view of God. A church that is pleasing to God says, this is the book that God intended for us to have, and it'll shape our lives, and we're going to live by his precepts and teaching. Now, here's number three. Paul says, avoid being corrupted by pride. Make sure you live right before outsiders. Make sure that you have the right view of Scripture. And in continuing in his conversation about the false teachers, notice what he says in verse 4. The false teacher is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about with questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy and strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that godliness is gained from such withdraw yourselves. Nothing will destroy a church more in their efforts to be pleasing to God. It's not just false teachers, but in the New Testament, false teachers not only teach the wrong thing, but it leads to the wrong kind of behavior. And so Paul says, if these false teachers have their way, Timothy, they're arrogant. They think they know a lot, but they don't know much. And if they get in, they'll corrupt the church through evil surmisings and arguments and questions. Stay away from them. Look at 1 Timothy 6 and notice in verse number 4, the old King James has this phraseology. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about. The newer translations don't go with doting about. The New American Standard says they're morbid. The ESV says they have an unhealthy craving for controversy. They like to argue. Paul is saying that these people, in their pride, they are sick. All they like to do as they approach the Bible is come up with questions and arguments and various things to just wrangle and argue about over and over again. Stay away from those kind of people. They'll ruin the church. I don't know how we've missed this, but in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, Paul over and over and over and over again says to Timothy, you don't have to answer every question. Some things are foolish, and you should stay away from them. He's writing this to preachers, and I can understand why he would say this. Over and over again, he drives home this point. Certain people have an agenda. They're not interested in the truth. They want to argue about words and strife and cause debate. And he says to Timothy and Titus, stay away from those kinds of people. Here's a brief sampling and a survey of how often this is said. We just read 1 Timothy 6, 4 and 5. But right before the last verse in this book, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 20, he says that there are some people that have questions about knowledge or science, falsely so-called. So called. They think that they know the truth, but they really don't. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, he says that there are some that give themselves over to arguments and words that are unprofitable. These words don't really mean anything. The things that they are arguing about, they don't help move the conversation forward. He says, stay away from them. Shun profane and unwise babblings and tales, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 16. Stay away from individuals of this mindset. Avoid foolish and unlearned questions, 2 Timothy 2, 23. He tells Titus, make sure that you have elders in the church. One of the reasons in Titus 1 and verse 14 is to guard against Jewish myths and genealogies and tales. And then he repeats it in Titus 3 and verse 9. The point to Timothy and Titus, and as an extension, the Christians in Ephesus and in Crete, was this idea. Some people are proud and prideful, and they would ruin the church if they had their way. We need to stand for the truth. Truth is absolute. We can know it. We can know what the Bible says, and we don't have to apologize for that. But at the same time, every one of us needs a humble disposition, which leads to godliness and not to ungodliness. If you look at the behaviors that Paul mentions in 1 Timothy 6, 4, and 5, they sound more like the works of the flesh than they do the fruit of the Spirit. And that's how this type of environment, if it has its way, ultimately works into the church and corrupts those that sit under that teaching for too long a time. And so he says, I want you to fight against it. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. 
and we should all know our place and guard against being lifted up with pride. Show of hands of those who know everything tonight. Show of hands. There are some people that are surprised that your hand's not up, by the way. Not that they believe you, but maybe sometimes we think we do. We don't. We don't know everything. Every one of us has something to learn. Paul says these false teachers, they think they know it, but they really don't. They profess to be wise. They think that they're smarter than other individuals, but they're really not. Job told his friends, truly you are the people, and wisdom will die with you, sarcastically in Job 12 and verse 2. Timothy, if false teachers have their way, they're prideful, they're arrogant, they argue around the same types of questions that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things, and they will ruin the church at Ephesus if they have their way. Paul had warned about this in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 32. And now he drives this point home further to Timothy. And he says, you make sure that you keep the church pure. Keep it pure as far as doctrine, but you keep yourself in check as well that you don't take on this type of a personality. Now here's number four. Paul tells Timothy, make sure that you guys guard against being covetous. He talks about money in verses 6 all the way down through verse 10, and then he picks this up again in verse 17 through 19. These people suppose that godliness is gain, but Paul says it's not. Having food and raiment, they don't let us be content with that in verse 8. Those that would be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and in perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and those that have coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Paul says, in the midst, what false teachers are after is gain physically, financially, but the goal is godliness and not goods. And we need to get this right. Make sure that we as a congregation keep a healthy view of material things. You may view these points as disjointed. They're not. Paul's tying this all together. He's saying, make sure that you know the truth, and then make sure that you have the right motivation, and then make sure that you have the right view of material things, because false teachers don't. The first century church was marked by her extravagant benevolence. When people obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter 2, you know what the church did. They sold their property and their goods, and they parted it to every man as they had need. They did it again in Acts chapter 4. Just ask Ananias and Sapphira, if being covetous will ruin your soul. If being greedy for gain will ultimately ruin you and disrupt your relationship with God, it will, and it can. And we won't be a church pleasing to God if we're materialistic, if we're fleshly-minded, if we're all about selfish gain. So Paul says, guard against it. Make sure that it doesn't corrupt you. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Acts 20 and verse 35, Paul said that to the elders at Ephesus. They knew this already, and still he repeated it because we often need to hear it again, and we need to hear it again. If you and I work a job, we will be compensated, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to make sure that we possess our possessions and they don't possess us. Money is a great servant and a terrible master. It's said that someone once asked John D. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? Rockefeller said, just a little bit more. What a sad state to be in. Paul says, I don't speak in respect of want. Whatever I've learned, therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and abound. Nothing wrong with having a lot. Paul says, everywhere in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, to have many wants and to suffer no lack, no need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And that's not just a personal thing, your view of money and my view of money. It's the congregation's view of money. What if the congregation is covetous? How is that going to affect the way that we support or fail to support missionaries or other good works? Paul says, don't fall in love with money. It'll ruin you. Look at 1 Timothy 6 again. And notice in summary what Paul says in verse 6, having godliness with contentment is a great gain. That is, God is more important than gold. In verse 7, you won't take any of it with you. It is certain. We brought nothing here. We will take nothing out. In verse 8, if you have food and clothing, that's enough. With that, be content. Money ruins people. At least the love of it does on occasion. In verse 9 and verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And he said, you know people who've tried this before, and it's destroyed them. Don't let it happen to you. And then he charges the rich in verses 17 through 19. Charge them that are rich in this world not to be high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. Do as much as you can to give away as much as you can to help other people so that you are not mastered by money. If you are, it will destroy you. Sometimes you and I may watch a scary movie or a movie of any kind where there's a bad guy and a good guy, and the bad guy's hiding, right? And you see him. The guy in the movie can't, and you're screaming at the TV like he can hear you or she can hear you. Don't go that way. Don't go behind that door. The bad guy is right there. They can't hear you. 
but you think they can. Paul sees where this love of money goes. And he's saying to Timothy, can you hear me? There's a snare. The word he uses for snare in verse 9 means to fall into a trap unexpectedly. That which catches somebody off guard and endangers them in its clutches. He's saying, the danger's right there. Don't fall into this trap. It'll destroy you. It'll rot you. It'll ruin you. You go away from it. Jesus met a man that we call the rich young ruler. And he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he gave a lot of good answers in Jesus' dialogue with him. And then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have, give it to the poor. And you have great treasures in heaven and come and follow me. And you know how it ends. He walked away sorrowful because he had great possessions, but he didn't have the greatest one, which is eternal life. Guard against covetousness because it'll destroy your heart. Guard against the want and desire always for more things. It'll corrupt you spiritually. It's funny that on our money we have this phrase, in God we trust. And the very object on which that phrase is written is God's highest competition often in the hearts of people. We say we trust God, and the very image on which that is printed is often the very thing that pulls people away from him. It's not money that's the problem. It's our relationship to it. Paul Solomon says, labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. Will you set your eyes on that which really is not? Riches really do make themselves wings and fly as an eagle toward heaven. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. Timothy, make sure that the church has a healthy relationship on material things and make sure to put eternal things first. What's the most important thing in the world? It's godliness. It's the key word in 1 Timothy, godliness. It appears over and over again, four times in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Strive after godliness in verse 3. He mentions it in verse number 6, and then he mentions it again in verse 11. Timothy, you follow after godliness, and you pursue that with everything within you, because that's worth more than all of the gold in the world. Here's the last one tonight. First Timothy, and this will be a positive one. We've talked about what we shouldn't do, things that we shouldn't let corrupt us, but make sure to concentrate on eternal things. This is my favorite part, really, in the whole book and in Paul's dialogue with Timothy, because so far he said a lot about them false teachers, people out there, what they would try to do to Christians. But now he really just gets eyeball to eyeball with Timothy, and he says, but you, O man of God, as Tyler read for us a moment ago, Timothy, this is about you now. You know what the false teachers are after, but you, O man of God, flee these things, and you follow after righteousness and faith and love and purity, patience, meekness. You remember the good confession that you made, Timothy. Hold firm to that. Fight the good fight of faith, verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life. And the good confession that you made before many witnesses. Timothy, make sure that you focus on things that really count. Everybody in the world who does not have their hope in Jesus Christ one day will literally see their whole world go up in flames. They will. Peter says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein. Timothy, flee these things. There are things to flee and things to follow. And Paul sets them before Timothy so that he might get them right. We sometimes sing a song, hold to God's what? Unchained. There's a line in that song. You better build your hopes on things eternal. The question is, are we? Are you? He says, you make sure to do it, Timothy. Look at verse 20 of chapter 6. Guard the good deposit which has been committed to your trust. Timothy, hold fast to the things that really count. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get distracted. One of the devil's greatest tactics is he gets us to believe that eternal things are temporary and that temporary things are eternal. Don't get those things confused. Timothy, you, old man of God, lay hold on eternal life. And when Jesus appears, and he will, verse 14 and 15, in that inapproachable light that he mentions in verse 16, you'll see his face in peace. And with that in mind, Timothy, you press toward the goal. This is reminiscent of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Lay up not for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust do corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but instead you lay up treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, where thieves don't break through and steal. Timothy, where your treasure is. The church at Ephesus, the church at South Florida Avenue, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Here's the encouragement for us this week. Lord's Day starts off the week. We worship on the first day of the week. And these lessons are designed to convict us, to encourage us, to push us off and launch us out into the week so that we might glorify God before outsiders and insiders, before the whole world. Here's the challenge. This week, do something that will matter in eternity. Do something that will matter when the world is on fire. And if you need ideas, you could start with prayer and Bible study and reading God's word, encouraging somebody, 
forgiving someone who's wronged you and begged your pardon, giving to someone in need, pray for a missionary, attend the worship services, build your hopes on things eternal. But you, O oh man of God or woman of God, flee these things and follow after the things that really matter. Be a good husband or wife or mother, all of those things. Those are not in addition to the work of the church. Those are the work of the church, and we should do them to the glory of God. Timothy, no matter what else happens in Ephesus, you know what I've taught you. You do the right thing. Paul wanted to get to Ephesus. He says, Timothy, I hope to make it to you shortly, but if I delay, you've really got a church manual with 1 Timothy and the rest of the New Testament that you might know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth, the congregation that takes the book of 1 Timothy and puts its teachings into practice, there's no doubt in my mind, it will be a church that's pleasing to God. The only question for us is this, are we going to do those things and do them consistently? I believe every one of us is up to the challenge to avoid the snares of the soul, to live as a family, to use our talents for the good and glory of God, to have sound, qualified, capable leadership, to get the worship right, and to make sure that we teach no other doctrine. Paul says, Timothy, if you do that, God will be pleased with you, and you'll be a church that glorifies God. Maybe tonight someone needs to lay hold on eternal life, as Paul told Timothy. You can do it by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Turning from your sins, confessing Jesus before men as the Son of God, and being immersed in water, baptized to have your sins washed away, you can rise to walk in newness of life. That is the sound doctrine, or at least a portion of the sound doctrine that Paul emphasized that Timothy should teach and never waver from. Maybe you need the prayers of the church tonight. We are your family. We'd be happy and willing to pray for you in any way that we can. If, we, if you need to respond tonight, request in our encouragement. The elders will be down here to receive you. If we can help you, come now as together we stand and as we sing.